Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kim Ricketts and I'm here to introduce and welcome Dr. Alva Noe, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Dr. Noe is here today to discuss Out of Our Heads, Why You Are Not Your Brain and Other Lessons from the Biology of Consciousness. This book challenges the assumptions underlying neuroscientific studies of consciousness. Dr. Noe asserts that there is an inextricable link between identity and environment and that consciousness arises from interactions with our surroundings. Consciousness is not something that happens inside us. It is something we do or make. Dr. Alva Noe is a writer and philosopher at UC Berkeley, where he is also a member of the Institute for Cognitive and Brain Sciences and the Center for New Media. For the last decade or so, his philosophical practice is concerned perception and consciousness, and his current research focus is art and human nature. He is also the author of Action in Perception. Please join me in welcoming Avanoi to Microsoft to discuss Out of Our Heads, Why You Are Not Your Brain, and Other Lessons from the Biology of Consciousness. Thank you very much. I'm going to begin by discussing a, a sort of an everyday phenomenon that um, many of you will have had. And I'm going to use that to set up the argument of the talk in my introduction of the book. Um, suppose you go to um, an art museum or, or a gallery. And imagine you encounter the work of an artist whose work is unfamiliar to you. Can you hear me? In the back, can you hear me? You encounter the work of an artist whose work is unfamiliar to you. Uh, maybe it's in a style that is radically unfamiliar to you. It's sometimes... I'll check and make sure it's not like I, don't, I don't notice myself amplified. I can hear you, but I don't hear you. Yeah, I, it, oh, are you now... There you go. Now it is. Let me, let me adjust its location. What, um, now am I, is, is that better? Is that a little bit easier to hear? So, you, so the, the situation I'd like you to imagine is that you've gone to a gallery and you're encountering the work in, by an artist which is very unfamiliar to you. It sometimes happens when you look at it that you don't get it. This is meant to be an everyday experience. You don't get it. It's, it strikes you as flat, as opaque, as, as uninteresting. Um, but you look further. You don't give up. Maybe the friend who's brought you to the gallery is a great fan of this artist, and she describes the picture to you that's in front of you and calls your attention to a certain structure or complexity in the picture that you hadn't noticed. Maybe you read the wall plaque that gives you some information. You think about the thing in front of you. Something remarkable sometimes happens. Whereas the picture was flat before, all of a sudden it reveals itself to you as having structure, whereas it was opaque now you can see into it. Whereas before it was uninteresting and unmeaningful, now you see meaning and interest in it. Now I'm very interested in this transformation that occurs, which we've all, we've all experienced something like this. Um, one of the things about this transformation is it's clearly a transformation in you. I'm assuming that the picture hasn't changed while you've been looking at it. So it's a transformation that took place in you but, very interestingly, it is not a merely subjective transformation, by which I mean it is not merely that you now think or feel differently about the thing in front of you. You are now able to see features of the thing in front of you, to discern qualities and properties of it that you couldn't perceive before. Now, what is this transformation that enables you now to see that which was there all along, but somehow not visible to you? There's a very good English word for it. It's called understanding. What happens is you acquired a certain understanding that had to do with seeing connections, participating in a, con in a conversation with your colleague, learning something about the background in which the piece was made, and the understanding dis enabled you only then first to see that which was there all along. The understanding helped you bring the work of art into focus as an object of perception. Now, I'm not here to talk to you today about art or the perception of works of art, but the reason I give this example is because it's intuitive and it's easy to sort of understand what's going on. And in fact, I think this structure that I've just described, the bringing of the world in focus by bringing practical or cognitive skills or, or more generally understanding to bear, is in fact 
the basic structure of all perceptual experience and of vast stretches of human consciousness. Um, that is to say, part of why art interests us is precisely that art recapitulates this, this kind of basic, this basic fact. Now, you might think there's another idea about, I'm just going to stick to the visual case because it's intuitive. There's another way you might think about what we see or what is visible. You might think that what we see is what projects to the eyes. What we see is what gives rise to patterns of neural activation in your brain. Um, but I think it's not that difficult to show you that um, that's an inadequate way of thinking about um, what we experience. Now, this is a, um, <coughs> a quick time video um, produced by the French psychologist Kevin O'Regan. I know that's not a French sounding name, but he is a French psychologist. Um, and um, it's a photograph, it's a moving image actually, of a Paris street scene, a woman, traffic in the background. Um, and the thing that's interesting about this image is that as you've been looking at it, it has been changing. Um, you probably, very few, noticed that the car was blue here, and it gradually turned red while you were looking at it. Now, if I had an eye tracking system on you, I could prove to all of you that you'd actually moved your eyes all over that first blue, gradually becoming red car. Um, your retinal cells were stimulated by the color of the car. Corresponding parts of your nervous system were stimulated by the color of the car. But the car's color didn't show up for you as changing. You didn't notice the change. You didn't experience the change. Now, what more sensual, bodily, basic, primitive aspect of our visual consciousness is there than our experience of the colors of things around us. The color was changing. You looked at it. You didn't see it. Why not? Because you didn't expect it to change, because you didn't know it was going to change, because you didn't ask the question, is the color of the car changing? You didn't, you didn't inquire. You didn't interrogate your environment with respect to that issue. Your nervous system was doing all the things the nervous system does when it experiences color, but you didn't secure awareness of the color change. So merely projecting into your eyes and stimulating your brain is not enough for something to show up for you and experience it. Nor is it necessary. Um, this is just a simple slide with some words of English. You, you see it. You detect the meaning right away. This is a slightly, I'm not sure how, how persuasive this example really is, but I mean, I like the fact that when you see this, you perceive the meaning. But there's some sense in which the meaning isn't there. Um, what's there are these marks or these projected images. Um, the meaning shows up for you because of what you know, because of your background knowledge of English. So there's some sense in which striking your eyes is not necessary for you to experience something. Something had to strike your eyes, but not the meaning. You experienced the meaning, but the meaning didn't strike your eyes. Now, what's also interesting about this slide is that it also allows us to make the point that I made on the previous slide, namely that um, Striking your eyes isn't sufficient for seeing either. Could I just ask you to read the slide? The illusion of seeing. Right. Um, you said the illusion of seeing. What it actually says is the illusion of, of seeing. But nobody sees that. Um, you, there'd be something wrong with you if you had seen it. Um, it's just we, we, don't, we don't really see. That's not what we're in the business of doing. We, we have a set of skills and expectations and knowledge, and we bring that to bear. And we see, in this case, you look. You kind of, you guess, you project a gist, and you don't really look any further. Um, so the point of this is that the world that shows up for us, and, and I should say that my book is about consciousness. I'm going to talk more about the book. But the phenomenon of consciousness, for me, ultimately is this question of how things show up for us and the way they show up for us and how to understand how they show up for us. And the, the, the picture I'm trying to suggest is a merely kind of projective, passive nervous system turned on by stimulation isn't enough. So if it's not enough, what, what more do we need? My thought is that instead of thinking of what we see as a matter of what projects to the eyes, think of what we see as what is available to us. Now, what projects to the eyes? On, on this kind of conventional view, light projects to the eyes, and then the brain constructs an image. On my view, 
The question is not what happens inside us when we're stimulated, but rather, what are we able to do in the situation? What do we have access to? What is available to us? What we have access to depends on what we know and what we can do. I have access to you, I can turn my head. I have access to you, I can turn my head. In a sense, I have access to my mom, I can just pull out my cell phone and call her. I have access to the space outside the room, even though I can't see it now, because I know in a kind of practical, implicit way that I can just go out and bring it into view. So if you think about our experience and the phenomenology of our experience, by, by phenomenology I mean think about sort of the lived character of our experience, we're not confined just to what projects to our eyes. We see the meanings of words. We see the occluded or hidden parts of objects. We see in the periphery of the visual field, even though it's strictly speaking out of view. So, what the, so the question of consciousness, the question of how the world shows up for us, needs to be understood as a question about what enables us to achieve access in this way to this extended space around us. And I think that the only full answer we're going to give to that question is going to be one in which the brain, the body, and the environment, including in many cases the social or cultural environment, all play an explanatory role in the story. Um, and I'll, I'll say more about that in just a moment. Let me say now, um, so that's kind of, that's sort of the first, the first break, is little three asterisks is now, I go to the next section of the talk. But the transition is this. Francis Crick, um, Nobel Prize winning co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, um, many of you may know that he spent the last portion of his intellectual career until his death working on the problem of consciousness. Um, and in about 1996, writing in the journal Nature, Crick wrote, this is pretty close to an exact quote, no longer need scientists sit idly by listening to the tedious discussions of philosophers perpetually disagreeing with each other. The problem of, <laughs> the problem of consciousness, he said, is a natural scientific problem. Remember, I'm a, my professional academic affiliation is philosophy. Um, so I applaud Francis Crick's thought that the problem of consciousness is a problem for natural science. I question whether it is any less a problem for philosophy for that reason. But more particularly, I'm afraid that Crick was um, sort of self-deluded uh, in thinking that he had himself, in his own work, or in the work of his research team, somehow transcended philosophy or left it behind. In fact, I think if you look at his work and the work he did, so much of what he did actually just took a particular philo philosophy for granted, and indeed took it for granted in such a way that he didn't even seem to be aware that philosophy was playing a role in his work. So, for example, in his 1996 book, um, which was a popular book, I should add, called The Astonishing Hypothesis. Um, Crick said, you, your emotions, your fears, your wishes, your desires, are nothing but the action of brain cells and their associated molecules. And he added, with something of a flourish, that this idea is so foreign to the ideas of most people alive today that it can truly be called astonishing. Okay, This is what he said on page 3 of his book. Now, the thing I want to say to you is that the only thing really astonishing about Crick's remark is how astonishing it isn't. That is to say, it is an old idea that there is inside of us a thing that thinks and feels and decides. It is an old idea that you are that thing inside of you that thinks and feels and decides. Now Descartes, who developed that sort of idea, thought that that thing inside of you which you are, that thinking, feeling, deciding thing which you are, was an immaterial soul stuff. Um, Crick favors a different view according to which the thing that does all that is your brain. Um, Crick thinks that the preponderance of evidence suggests that it's the brain rather than something immaterial that does the thinking, feeling, and deciding. But what I want to call your attention to is first 
the basic sort of formal similarity of his view and the old-fashioned view that he opposes, and second, this crucial fact, which if Crick were here with us, he would admit in a minute, that at the current time we don't have any clue how the brain, how the action of the brain, the action of brain cells and their associated molecules gives rise to experience. In fact, we don't have any better idea how the brain does it than how the immaterial soul does it. So I think what this means is we really need to try to think differently about this whole question. We need to step back and entertain what really would be an astonishing hypothesis. And here's the really astonishing hypothesis that I want to argue for and that I do argue for in my book. You are not your brain. It is not your brain that thinks and feels and decides. Not because something immaterial does it, but because that's just the wrong kind of thing to ask. Consciousness is not something that happens inside us. It's something we achieve or enact or accomplish or do based on our or thanks to our embodied and situated interaction with and presence in the environment. And my claim is that if we expand the domain in which we try to shape a theory from purely neurological factors to encompass also behavioral and environmental factors, that we actually can begin to explain what neither Crick nor anybody else has been able to explain just in neural terms alone. Okay? So that my idea is that looking for neural correlates of consciousness, where as Crick understood that term, that means actually looking for neural systems which are the consciousness, is like looking for the internal correlates of dance. You can't understand dance in terms of an event happening inside me. Dance and consciousness are not like digestion. Or to change the metaphor, maybe consciousness is more like money than it is like digestion. That is, the value of money doesn't correspond to some molecular property of the dollar bill. It's something else. It's not that kind of thing. So my thought is we really need to rethink how we look at it. And my positive point is that if we do this, we can actually come up with very different looking positive theories. Now, let me say one other thing um, before I kind of start to give you some examples to kind of show, to try to make good on the promise. Um, I've been, I'm, I'm, I'm an academic, but I didn't write this book for an academic audience. And one interesting experience that I've had as I've kind of gone around the country talking to people about this book is they always think that if I'm criticizing a brain theory of consciousness, what I'm really doing is like trying to make, make room for God or something like that. It's really, it's really religion, ver it's like the soul versus materialist science. And that's not at all my project. I'm actually, what interests me is that I want to understand the phenomena of consciousness as natural phenomena, that is to say, as in the, the purview of science. And the question is, what conception of our nature do we need in order to do that? Can we think of our nature as a sense, at least our cognitive experiential nature, as essentially neuroscientific? There's lots of examples in our experiential lives, and you know this as computer scientists. There's lots of examples in our, in our lives, in our cognitive knowledge lives, where we know that you can't make straightforward reductions of one domain to another. And you can't do a certain kind of evolutionary biology where you tell stories about adaptation and fitness if you think of the animal as just a conjury of atoms, right? You need a certain kind of level-appropriate way of modeling your domain. And so one of my arguments is that if we're going to make progress on these fundamental issues about the mind, we need to find the level appropriate to the study of mind. And my claim is that that level is not neurological, but that level is more ecological. Um, and then another way, another way of just making this positive point, just in case any of you are inclined to label what I've said in, in, in this way, my claim is not that the brain is not necessary for consciousness. The brain is necessary for consciousness. The question is whether it's sufficient, whether we can understand consciousness just in terms of the brain. And my argument is that we can't. And I try to offer some positive reasons for thinking that we can go another way, and moreover, I try to show that the reason why this avenue has not been explored by so many people working within the neuroscience of consciousness, even very brilliant people like Francis Crick, is because actually they've been straitjacketed by some unquestioned philosophical Cartesian assumptions that consciousness is this thing inside us. Okay, so that's the picture. So you said when you introduced me, you used the word inexplicable or something to characterize what I said. That's not my view at all. I'm not trying to mystify. 
I'm trying to do science. I, I think of myself as, as a member of the cognitive science community trying to call to task some sloppy thinking among cognitive scientists. And part of the reason I wrote this book for a wider audience is because I think it's such an insular community, we need to get some fresh blood in, into the conversation. OK, now, um, let me give you, I've, I've got about 15 minutes, so let me give you um, three, let me give you an example of the theory at work. Um, first, let me remind you of experiments that you've probably heard about over the years, because they've been going on for over 100 years, on reversing goggles. Left, right, reversing goggles, or up, down, inverting lenses. You know, if you wear glasses, what, what do glasses do? They, they change the angle at which light reaches the eye. They bring it to a focus in a place where it, it, it ought to be brought into focus. Um, you can create lenses that more radically refract light, so that in particular you could create prismatic lenses so that light entering from the left side of your visual field will systematically stimulate your eye as if it were coming from the right side of your visual field, and vice versa. What happens when you put on left, right, reversing goggles? <coughs> you might naturally assume that what happens is things on the left look as if they're on the right. Um, in fact, if you put on the goggles, what happens is that you have a kind of wacky visual distortion. Boundaries between objects become in unstable. Surfaces seem to bulge and heave and wobble. The visual world becomes unstable and confusing, almost as if you'd taken a drug. You know, as if there was like a street value for selling these goggles or something. Um, why should this be? The goggles are no more distorting the light or depriving it of information than your regular spectacles. The light is not, the, the glasses are not introducing any kind of distortion. So why should it be? Here's, here's the idea that I've had and that my collaborators and, collaborators and I have developed. When we ordinarily move around, our, our movements produce sensory change. If I step forward to you, the character of my sensory stimulation is altered by my very own movements. If I move my eyes and head, I produce sensory change. When I approach an object, it looms in my visual field. When I walk around it, its profile changes. When I blink, I interrupt the sensory stimulation. In these and other ways, there are complicated patterns of dependence of sensory stimulation on movement. And perceivers, I propose, have a kind of implicit understanding of these patterns of sensory motor dependence. Kevin O'Regan and I developed this idea in a 2001 paper in a journal called The Behavioral and Brain Sciences, and it's the main theme of my 2004 book. Um, my thought is that when we explore the world perceptually, we use that sensory motor knowledge to bring the world into focus in very much the same way that we use our conversational, conceptual knowledge to make sense of the painting when we were in the art gallery. So now we can say, with that as background, what happens when you put on the goggles? Your sensory motor knowledge, that is to say, your expectations, your knowledge about the way your own movements will produce sensory change, are abolished, abrogated. Now, with the goggles, moving your eyes has have unanticipated, unexpected consequences. The actual sensory stimulation is the same as it was, just slightly relocated, systematically relocated. But the way that sensory stimulation fits in a larger behavioral situation has been changed. And my thought is that that change actually deprives the experience of what we need for the experience to be a way of being in touch with the world around us. You abrogate the sensory motor knowledge. So you can think of experience as having, sensory experience as having two parts. There's the input and there's the knowledge. The goggles abrogate the knowledge. Okay? If you wear the goggles for a long period of time, you can adapt to them. That is to say, you build up new sensory motor expectations, and what happens? Voila, the world gets back into focus. So now, the object on the left is stimulating your eyes and your brain as if it were on the right, but it looks as if it's on the left. Okay? So, the message I want to take from this is, look, we're talking about a phenomenon of perceptual consciousness. We're talking about the difference between something looking as if it's there and looking as if it's there. Right? This is, this is consciousness. But we're explaining it not by looking at the intrinsic character of neural activation produced by the object, but by the way that neural activation is bound within a action context, or a movement action context, or a movement action expectation loop. And what I submit is that to really understand this phenomenon, to really explain it, 
We have to talk about the shape of the animal, the, the layout of the body plan, the, the kind of environment in which the animal finds itself. And we can't restrict our attention to brain cells alone. The brain is an intimate part of the story. It's not the whole story. Now, let me give you another example. Um, um, this next example involves animal experimentation, and I realize that some people are upset by descriptions of animal experimentation, but I'm just going to focus on something that actually has nothing to do with that. Um, Mirganka Sir, a uh, neuroscientist at MIT, this is work started in the 90s going, going on into the early 2000s, um, did, did experiments with ferrets. Ferrets are born in a very neurologically immature state, and he did an, uh, a surgical um, operation on newborn ferrets where he spliced the eye in such a way, or the, he actually performed an operation on the ganglion cells in the retina of the ferret, so that these cells sprouted axonal connections to the auditory thalamus and the auditory parts of the brain, that is what would normally be the auditory thalamus and the auditory parts of the brain, rather than to the visual thalamus and visual parts of the brain. So, in other words, he rewired the ferret's eyes to the hearing parts of their brain. Now, what happens when your eyes are wired to the hearing parts of your brain? One possibility you might think, at least a logical possibility, is that you would hear with your eyes. But that's not what happens. What happens is you see with the auditory parts of your brain. And I have a little schematic map here to kind of illustrate the structure of this. Um, so, Normally, I have th two mappings here, a mapping between the input source at the sensory periphery of the body and the cortical area, and I have a mapping between the cortical area and the phenomena at the level of consciousness. And normally, the retina projects to the visual cortex, giving rise to visual experience, and the auditory stimulus projects to the auditory cortex, giving rise to, uh, to um, auditory experience. In this case, you have an event of plasticity, in which through an actual rewiring between the retina and the auditory cortex, you have auditory cortex receiving what neuroscientists call afferents or stimulation from a non-standard source. And remarkably, actually this area would be more elegant if I'd written it like that, because what happens is auditory cortex changes its function to adopt a visual function. Okay? So, what explains this change in the character of auditory cortex? Actually, let me, let me just go back one second and kind of try to remind you, in case I went, maybe I was a little bit too quick about this, what my logic is here right now. What I'm, what I'm giving you now is a series of cases of phenomena in which the mapping between an experiential state and a, and a neural state is varied and plastic. And I'm asking the question, given that there's no, that shows that there's no intrinsic necessary connection between this neural system and this experiential state. And so given that, the question then is, what determines it? What governs it? What explains the correlations that we find? Why is, why is neural activity in this area of the brain experienced as visual? Why is neural activity in this area of the brain experienced as auditory? And so in the case of the goggles case, what I showed you was that activation in an area is only the experience of left visual field rather than right visual field because of the way it's bound up in a larger context. And something very similar, I think, goes on here. What makes auditory cortex visual cortex for these rewired ferrets is the fact that the neural activation here varies as a result in relation to the animal's movement in just the same ways in, it would in normal visual cortex. In other words, it's not the local pattern, but it's the larger um, sensory motor structure that does the explanatory work. Now, one thing about this case, I'm kind of going fast, but I want to get a few more things out because I expect you to have some discussion. Um, one thing that's going on here is this is all inside the brain, right? This is what changes is the mapping from the surface of the brain or the retina to the interior portion of the brain. 
and then you've got a resulting change in the character of experience. But I now want to give you an example where there isn't a rewiring inside the brain, and, and that would be my final example. Yeah? In this case, is that experience immediate, or does it only evolve after some time? The, um, what, what, the way this works is, the reason why ferrets are selected is that the ferrets are born in a neurologically very immature state, um, so that the wiring up of their perceptual systems anyway sort of takes time. Actually, humans are somewhat similar, although we're not as immature. So what happens is, during the normal development of the animal over, over weeks and months, it develops these perceptual capacities in this rewired way. And you might ask yourself, how do they know all this? Well, what they do is they only rewire one hemisphere so that they have, in a single animal, they have a trained sensitivity to light stimuli and sound stimuli. And then they can see that there's no behavioral difference in the way it responds to light stimuli and sound stimuli in rewired parts, in, in, in the rewired hemispheres. Um, yes? Is there any modulation in the quality of the division of the ferret experiences from the auditory? Well, this is the, the $60,000 question, because we can't really ask the ferret, right? Um, nobody's figured out how to talk to ferrets. There are interesting cases um, where we can ask. Um, let's see if I have a slide for this. No, I'm sorry, I don't have a slide. But there's a, um, there is a case that's analogous to this with um, humans. Um, when blind people learn to read Braille, long-term blind people, um, Braille is a tactile sensory problem, right? It's, you're feeling the raised figures. It's been shown that there is neural activation in visual cortex while they're feeling the characters. And this has something to do with the fact that the visual cortex is especially useful for processing fine spatial detail. But the fact is that when they're engaged in this tactile task, there's an activation in their visual cortical areas. And moreover, and this is the interesting point, if you provide a blast of magnetic energy to the visual cortex, what's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. You just give a magnetic pulse that momentarily interrupts processing in visual cortex. If you do that to a blind person reading Braille, they experience tactile illusions. They bumps where there are no bumps. Um, and you can ask them. So in that case, they say, I'm, you know, I'm feeling in the normal way. When you play with the visual parts of my brain, it's disrupting my, my tactile experience. So maybe we could use that as indirect evidence that similar things are going on here. But there's a certain, a certain line of skepticism about my argument would take the form of questioning whether, whether I have um, gone far enough in interrogating the actual character of these animals' experiences. I see hands flying up now, but let me just make one more point and then I'll close and we can have a more free-willing discussion, okay? Um, because I, I, I did want to give you one more example on the table, which is directly along these lines. Um, an, an engineer by the name of Paul Bakirita, who's recently passed away, um, back in the late 60s and early 70s and then on through the, the 90s, 80s and 90s, <coughs> devised what he called a tactile vision sensory substitution system. He took a camera, which was worn by a, a blind person, and wired it up to an array of vibrators or electrodes, which were also worn by the blind person. And there was a, it, the, the, the information presented to the camera was transduced in such a way that the visual information produced patterns of vibrations on the skin. So the visual information is actually producing somatosensory stimulation. And in a very short amount of time, his subjects, and I've recently been corresponding with somebody who was in the lab when this work was going on and described very vividly some of the responses to me. Um, what he found was that in a very short period of time, the person outfitted with this so-called TVSS, tactile visual sensory substitution system, was able to make what I think one is justified in calling visual judgments on the basis of these vibrations. So for example, a person with the TVSS apparatus could stand here and count the number of people in the room, or say that you're sitting closer to me than you, and that you're to the left of you. Now normally touch operates by putting your body into actual contact with something, but this is visual in the sense that it's, 
interrogating a manifold at and removed from your body. And moreover, people who got a little bit trained with this could reach out and pick something on a moving conveyor belt and so on. Okay? So, what's going on here? So we can think of, we can think of, um, so what I've, what, I've, what I've put here is, we can think of this in terms of three mappings. A mapping between the distal object and the sensory periphery of the body. Another mapping between the sensory periphery of the body and a cortical area. And then a final mapping between the cortical area and experience. Normally, if an object array stimulates the eyes, it activates visual cortex and gives rise to visual experience. This blue line here signifies the TVSS machinery. So what happens with TVSS is the object stimulates touch receptors through a camera, stimulating somatosensory cortex, giving rise to feelings of being touched. But then what's remarkable is you get, after a short period of time, this adaptation. The object stimulates the touch receptors, activates the somatosensory areas, but gives rise to a visual experience. Now the reason why this is a continuation of your question is we could argue whether it's a visual experience or not. That's kind of, in a way, where the action is. But if you'll work with me, or if you'll accept, for the sake of argument at least, that it is a visual experience, then we have an interesting question. What causes somatosensory cortex to change its function for consciousness? Not the fact that there's been a rewiring between the sensory exterior of the body and the cortical area, because that has not been rewired. So we need to look for something else to find out the critical factor that causes this to happen. I think that the clue is that what this system does is it allows you to learn new ways of interacting with the environment. New, to use the term I used before, sensory motor dependencies. Now your movements in relation to the environment produce changes in a way which turns out to be like the way in which visual interaction with the environment produces neurological changes. So what I say is that this is a visual experience, not because of anything intrinsic to the character of the neural activity, but because of this whole loop. And the critical thing I want to direct your attention to is that that loop crossed the boundary of the skull. The distal object is part of the loop. So my, I'm going to just wrap up now and, and turn to questions, because we're, we're ready and I've gone on for a little bit too long. But So my point is this. If we want a neuroscience of consciousness, we can't just look inside the skull. And it's, an, it's, a, it's a, essentially a stale philosophical dogma that has led scientists to think they, can, they, they are somehow confined to what's going on inside the skull. The brain is contextualized. It's contextualized in the body of the animal and in the environment. Our ability to perceive, our ability to, for the world to show up for us depends upon what we can do. That depends on the way we're built, not just the way our brains are built, but it also depends upon the kinds of environments in which we find ourselves, the kinds of affordances and possibilities that a certain landscape affords us. Um, we need to try to re-envision an empirical study of consciousness that takes these facts about the brain in the context of the body and the context of the environment seriously. Now, one last thing I just want to throw out a kind of robotics-related idea since it interests this audience, maybe. One of the interesting things about so much work in, in artificial intelligence and robotics is it has been geared towards creating smart cognizers and calculators and figurers out of what's going on around them on the basis of these impingements. Um, one of the claims I make in the book is that if you want to make, an, if you want to make a system with a mind like ours, you've got to make a system with habits like ours. That is to say, skills like ours, with a coupling to the environment like ours. That's a tall order, but I don't see any reason in principle why it's impossible. To make an artificial mind would probably end up being something like making an artificial life. So anyway, um, thank you very much for your attention. It's a tricky question. So, the, the, um, you know, 
the word consciousness wasn't sort of uttered by the mouths of neuroscientists until very recently. Um, consciousness was considered a sort of a, a messy, vague, not sufficiently precise notion for a science to investigate. Um, if you look at the tradition of, say, vision science, vision science, of course, did start off, um, for example, in the work of Hubel and Weasel, which ultimately led to the Nobel Prize in looking at feature detector approaches. Um, in a way, Hubel and Weasel's work simply masks the problem of consciousness. So you've got these internal representations, but what makes them visual, as opposed to some other way of representing the world? What is it about these cells that makes them have a net visual effect? And so this is a question that would be, would be thought about now. Yes? Um, actually, actually, the man in front of you had tried to ask before. Yes, yes. Oh, actually, two questions. First question, yeah. uh, uh, In the ferret experiment, I was wondering if the auditory section of the brain um, continue to produce auditory signals as well to multitask and take on both the visual and the audio work, or did it s devote itself solely to the video and, and dump the audio that was its original function? Um, and then the second question is in the experiment with the, uh, uh, the tactile, I'm wondering if it was used with both people that have been blind from birth and so would not have ever had the experience of, of vision and people who had become blind. And so if it was the case that they it was used with people who had blind, <coughs> if those people in describing the experience were able to say, it's it's I'm seeing something and I know what that means because you know I saw something for years before I went blind, mm -hmm. so I understand what that experience is. Right. Um, as to the first question, I think I don't know the answer. I think I had assumed, I think I've always assumed that, that um, when, the when the neural resources were captured by a visual task, they stopped performing the auditory task. But um, you know, in line with the question that was posed here earlier, it might be the case that whenever these people, these ferrets rather, see, maybe there's a ringing in their ears. <laughs> that's, that's a possibility. I don't know. But my, my belief is that there's a kind of um, an absorption of the auditory the, the relevant auditory cells from the relevant hemisphere into the visual task at the expense of auditory processing. But I'd actually have to go back and remind myself of the, of the facts. Um, and then in the second case, all different kinds of subjects were used, including non-blind people. But the email that was just sent from, to me by a person uh, named Frank Wilson, who worked in Bakirita's lab, said that the initial person was somebody who'd been, I think, early blind in his life but described one day with this machinery on him. He was actually a collaborator, not just a subject. He'd been, he'd been working in the lab. All of a sudden, he sort of exclaimed that he was having a kind of looming sensation. Um, that is, it was a, it was a, a shock, a, a, a striking feeling of, I'm having a kind of experience which is utterly different than the kind I'm otherwise able to have. There's another experiment, another body of literature done by a woman, by a man in Holland, um, whose name escapes me at the moment, which has to do with audio, audio visual sensory substitution rather than tactile visual, where visual information is transmuted in such a way as to produce tones that are heard rising and falling through earphones. And the reason I said a woman is that the main subject that he worked with was a woman whom I've met, and she had been sighted as a girl and then lost her sight. And she described, she described herself as being able to see and, and recognizing that it was a, a sight experience that she had once known. Yes? When you consider a program and ask what's it going to do, you have to consider the input you're going to feed it. This is actually the fundamental theorem of computing around the Turing Hall problem. Your hypothesis seems to be that what this brain is going to do is determined by its input. Uh, and the interesting examples you give is that it's determined by the input in highly abstract and sophisticated ways. Is that about right? Um, one way of putting it is that I guess you could say that. Although the question is the, the really the question is what we what we think of as the input, how we characterize the input, and how we as theorists need to characterize the input to understand why the system is functioning as it is. Um, attempts to characterize the input uh, 
purely in terms of the, say, intrinsic properties of the irradiation of the photoreceptors, don't seem to get traction. Yeah, that's insufficient abstraction. It's insufficient <laughs> abstraction. So, um, so I guess that's about right, what you said. I guess the reason I'm bulking is that one of the, one of the ideas I like, it's implicit in, in my presentation, is that in a way the system is offloading a certain task of figuring out how to represent it by taking for granted the fact that it's having these real, real world, real time interactions with objects that sort of um, give it all the information it needs as it needs it. Um, and part of the attraction of this way of thinking is that in a way we let, we let the world serve as its own abstract representation of itself for the purposes of these computations. If that makes sense. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I have a question that's perhaps partially a challenge also. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if I didn't find the, the examples you presented uh, compelling enough to say that we couldn't explain them just in the frame of the brain alone. Because um, I think if you add to the, 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 the usual sensory system that we have, and the, the input that the brain receives, the fact that there's also a feedback loop in our motor system that gives us an idea of what our bodies do at any given point. You could explain the, the confluence of those and how the visual experiences, for instance, get created because of the position and, and the movement of our body just within the brain itself. And I'm not sure if you're aware of the book called Unintelligence by Jeff Hawkins. Yeah. Um, I believe it's, it's not his original research, but I believe it sort of synthesizes research of different um, other scientists, his point is pretty much that, that this is a very critical component of how our brains work, is that we have this feedback loop that, that constantly um, tells us what we're doing. Right. And in that sense, you really wouldn't need this environment, strictly speaking. It is just, the brain in its own way is just locked up in this cage in our skull. It just happens to receive signals from this variety of sources. So you could say, you can extrapolate and say, if we took the, the body away, just fed that same brain the right set of signals, it would produce the same kind of experiences. Yeah, that's an excellent question. You should be a philosophy student. Um, um, yes, they don't pay enough. Uh, um, but um, I think all the work of your challenge is done by the phrase, strictly speaking. <laughs> um, because let's fill in the details. There's actually a lovely little article I read recently by, by a friend of mine named Evan Thompson and one of his uh, collaborators named, um, named uh, Diego, uh, Diego Cosmelli, um, uh, who, um, who says, okay, let's take this idea seriously and see how much we need to build up. To, you know. So we start off with the intuition that you could have consciousness in a brain in a vat. Let's start off with the idea that maybe just a few cells in a Petri dish. Well, is that going to give you what you want? No. You've got to build up a little bit more structure than that. Let's build up a little bit more and build up a little bit more and see how far out we need to build before we get the right feedback loops that we want. One of the interesting things they, they point out is that if you do get a brain in a vat, that vat needs to be a pretty sophisticated vat because it needs to enable the support of the metabolic activities of the brain. It needs to dispose of waste. Um, and they make the argument that if you fill it out a little bit more, it kind of, you pretty soon what you realize you're doing is you're actually describing a body. So you've got a brain in a body. And I would extend the argument further and say that if you really try to think what kinds of delicate inputs and uh, feedback loops, sort of motor signals out, sensory signals in, feedback from the motor system back in, body monitoring, if you actually try to build it out, what you'll find that you'll end up doing is building, or, or at least it may be that the only way you can actually get it right would be by building a world, building a world for the brain. And that a lot of the work is essentially done by the world. You know, whenever we talk about these brains and vats, you know, we always sort of imagine something like the Matrix or, um, or an evil, all-powerful um, all neuroscientist who's, who is essentially as complex as the world, as surprising as the world. So, so that's not a principled response to you because I'm sort of saying maybe you're right, but maybe you're not right. Right? Maybe you're right, maybe you're not right. But let me, let me give you one more, but let me just make one little footnote to that, which I think is interesting. And it picks up on what I said to you. Um, 
One of the things we're very bad at is memorizing detail. That's, in a way, the upshot of these demos I showed you in the beginning, which are sometimes called change blindness. Um, the old view is that we look, we scan, we build up an internal model, and then once we've got that internal model, we don't need the world. We've just got our model. But it turns out we're bad at keeping models stable in the head. We don't need to keep the model stable in the head because the world is right there, and we can sample it as we need it. And in a way, quite apart from the possibility of the scenario you give, one thought is from an evolutionary point of view, it's far more plausible to think that we're built to be able to uh, suck up the information we need as we need it, rather than somehow generating it on our own. Yes? Um, I see a lot of the talk has been done um, uh, regards actually the, the, the processing of the brain, how it could process outside and how could it produce a particular output on the basis of prediction, on the basis of what environment may be, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, yet the, 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 the main theme is consciousness, right? Now, there are, um, you, you're probably very familiar with David Chalmers' to, Towards the Unified uh, Theory of Consciousness, his, his, his book that he wrote. Uh, it's like, it seems like in, in your talk, the, the, the concept itself of consciousness has been sort of like uh, pushed a little bit to the side in the sense that all these things may be true, all these things that you're describing may be true. But on the, on the other hand, I don't get a sense uh, to the fundamental um, question, it is, what is this consciousness anyway? I mean, many scientists are, would actually even uh, disagree with the last column you have on your, on your, on your chart, saying that a qualita a qualitative experience actually doesn't even exist. I mean, it's something that purely, it's a machinery that processes things, and uh, uh, consciousness arises magically as a byproduct of the, of the uh, you heard that, uh, I'm sure, that argument many, many times. Um, and David Chalm Chalmers goes on to saying that actually, uh, 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 there doesn't seem any reason why consciousness is useful at all for the functioning of the human body. I mean, it, it brings forward the theory of the zombie. You know, if you being, uh, if you have a, you know, the the, 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 the the example, if you have a man that is exactly like a man, or exactly like a man, etc., but he has no consciousness, well, if he has a machinery, he will react properly to all impulses, will behave normally. So the mystery remains: what is this consciousness that we are talking about? We are trying to pin down. We want to include maybe the metaphysical or in the scientific, but we really don't know what it is. So I have a feeling that we are still talking about something which we have ill-defined, which we don't know what it is. We know it's there because we have a very um, strong subjective evidence of it, but we don't have any objective evidence of that. And in that, uh, in that, uh, we don't have any objective evidence of that. Is really the dilemma because science only deals with the objective very well. It has no no claim that he can, he can deal with subjective. He has nothing in its methods that can deal with subjectives. So I'm wondering if, uh, um, if that particular issue has been uh, maybe personally omitted from, from your work or, uh, or, uh, or uh, some other things that you want to say regarding that. Yeah. Thank you very much for that question. I hope I'm, it's a, you, you took time to articulate it carefully, and I don't want to take time now to repeat what you said for the audience, but I hope the audience got the basic idea of your question. Um, the, 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 the challenge is essentially this. There is a way of thinking about consciousness where consciousness seems utterly interior and utterly detached from the physical. And likewise, there's a way of thinking about the physical whereby the physical world, the material world, seems at least notionally, at least logically, um, um, detached from or distinct from the domain of consciousness. So the thought that you're referring to with the zombie case is that it seems as if one could describe the layout of particles in the universe or in a person and specify everything, and nothing follows whatsoever as to what it is like to be that person. So that you can imagine a possible world in which somebody were in exactly my state now but not having the thoughts and feelings that I'm now having. Um, and this is sometimes, uh, David Chalmers described this as the hard problem of consciousness. Um, um, the same issue is approached sometimes with the phrase, which I believe I used in my talk briefly, the idea that there's an explanatory gap between a description of the physical world and a description of the domain of consciousness. I have not ignored this question. I have not pushed it to one side. I have tried to suggest an alternative way of framing the problem so that the problem doesn't arise. Um, 
what, what this way of framing the problem takes for granted is a certain conception of the material, a certain conception of the neutral, mind-free, unproblematic, describing the position of every atom in the universe sort of point of view. And then the question is, how do we draw out of that some account or some rationale for, for what consciousness has to do with it? And one thing I've tried to suggest, in a way, is that we're not actually entitled to that um, to that standpoint that is already the way we think about the biological world or the world of, of, of the organism or indeed of our own bodies is pitched at a level in which um, there is meaningful contrast between self and other, between purposes, aims, ends. Um, this, is, this is what we see when we're doing when we're doing biology, if you look at a simple bacterium, we don't describe that bacterium just as a collection of atoms. We pick it out as a, as a player in a drama. And it's a player in a drama. It has a certain unity. It has a certain integrity in relation to the environment in which it finds itself. It moves in the direction of greater concentrations of sugar because it needs to move in the direction of greater concentrations of sugar. Not that it does it on purpose or knows that it has those needs, but there's a, there's a narrative there. And my, my basic idea is that we need to really rethink our conception of the substrate in terms of which we tried to explain consciousness. And that when we do rethink the substrate, the problem, of the, problem the mystery, goes away. Now, you may think that's just reintroducing the mystery at another place. And maybe it is. But it's a better place. And in particular, it's a better place for this reason. It finds that the mystery of consciousness is intimately related to the question of the mystery of life itself. And it's not, we can't just take for granted, in my view, a conception of consciousness as utterly interior and qualitative and distinct from the manner of our interaction with the world around us. Yes? Um, so there was a point, and I don't remember exactly where you, you did make. Um, Acknowledgement of the behavioral sciences. So I've, I've sort of two angles of uh, what I'm s I have fully formulated as a question. One is I believe you're at Berkeley, right? Yes. Is that where Freitoff Capra is? Um, he's in the area. I think he's in not at the area. university. Okay. So, so do you two work at all? I don't know if you've read his book Hidden Connections. I haven't. But he br brings together biology and um, the behavioral sciences and social sciences. Um, and what I find myself thinking through your talk is, you know, this whole combination of brain, body, and environment and you are not your brain, there's also the whole you are not your thoughts, and there's so much in our environment that influences our filters of how we experience things, and I think we are challenged to distinguish between a behavior description versus a thought. Like, we, we sometimes get blinded by our thoughts, but our thoughts aren't necessarily you know, a accurate, right? Their judgments, their assumptions, whatnot. So I'm curious in your research if you're looking at all at the behavioral influences of your hypothesis here, your position here. Hmm. Or behaviors, not even necessarily, necessarily behavioral science, but behaviors. So you, you mean sort of behaviors in the sense of um, maybe bad things that you're doing in your life? Or I'm not, I'm not sure I really understand. Right. Maybe I be bad, yeah. but um, they are the way in which we see, and I'm using see yeah. in, you know, yes. wider than just what you yes. physically see, because a blind person also, you know, sees and um, is influenced by judgments, and if they're not conscious of those judgments, mm -hmm. they might really believe what they see, so they are living in their brain of what, what they believe to be true, but mm -hmm. it might just be... Um, um, influenced by their judgments or assumptions that they haven't checked because they're not conscious of them. Hmm. So it just seems like there's this other side of maybe my personal curiosity around hmm. the biology of consciousness has to have <coughs> the behavioral part that you know feels like it's in your brain, but it's not in your brain. Like you said, it's part of the other. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think I have a better sense of what you're getting at. And, and let me try to relate it to something that I did mention and that I'm very committed to. And this is the idea that um, what we can, I, my metaphor of consciousness is, is reaching out and picking something up. You need to know how to do that. You can't pick up everything. You're too far away for me to reach out and touch now. But then, of course, I can walk over to you. So there's a sense in which in my, 
touchability space. You're in my touchability space. You're just a bit farther away than this. Um, and likewise, we have lots of different kinds of skills, cognitive, behavioral, um, interpersonal, linguistic, conceptual, sensory motor, that enable us to achieve contact with the world around us. But we're also, on my view, limited by that which we know. Um, what, and, and that's the importance of education, uh, and education both in the formal sense and in the, in the sense of just growing and living, that we learn and we, we require new knowledge and new skills that enable us to become aware of new things. And in particular, within education, I think, and this is what I began with, this tells us something about the special importance of art, because the, the, the natural thing that art does for us is it puzzles us. It, prevents, it pr pr provides us with something which is, in some sense, at a glance, not masterable, like the world itself. It's something which, at a glance, goes beyond what we know from what we can expect or take for granted. And thus, a work of art, my next book is about art, actually, a work of art is an occasion for us to acquire new understanding, new skills, and, and thus have new experiences. And, um, and as I said at the beginning, I actually really think that that's kind of what our, that's the basic shape and structure of our normal, of our normal life. So this connects to your idea of we're limited, in some sense we're limited. For instance, another, a nice little angle of your question is the experience of novelty. If something is too novel, we can't experience it. If it's too radical, we can't see it. Schubert once said, I was told, um, that it's very easy to write a great song. You just write a song that sounds like music people have heard before that they haven't heard before. Um, in other words, it needs to kind of be familiar in relation to our expectations in order for us to even recognize it as, as a good piece of music. Maybe, but I, I find myself thinking of Cezanne, who is the one who broke the model of how people were looking at art by doing something that so broke the model that, I mean, he was ostracized, but actually it opened up a new way of seeing. So it wasn't a piece of music, so to speak, that they were familiar with by being but yet new to, right? Like he totally broke the mind. But he, but he conducted his skirmishes at the limits of where people knew and what they were working so that some of us were able, some, some people were able to recognize how what he was doing was precisely an extension of something known. So he got allies. Well, he's not just got allies. His, what he did was intelligible because he went to the, I have a section in my book actually, it's called The Limits of the Known World. He went to the limits of the known world and then thought about ways of going a little farther. Um, you can't just start start out there in the uncharted territories. It's not it's not recognizable. Maybe one more question. That... Okay. Yes. So you were just talking about you know the whole behavior and how you infer things. So there is a theory in the brain where you know it's neural network. So you build a connection to another one, and if you do it repeatedly, then it becomes almost like an indentation in land where water can flow through. A landscape. And a landscape exactly. So that, you know, if you dam one area and like either the eyes can't see anymore and you bring it in another way, that you create, you can create another landscape in another part of the brain and that's the plasticity and stroke victims or whatever. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that I have is, you said, you know, I can touch this and, or I can, I know I'm too far away from you, but I can imagine flying over to you or I can imagine teleporting myself mm -hmm. back home to where I come from. But I can't. So how does your theory deal with that? Like the imagination and what is not in the environment and what's not really explicable? You know, we've no experience. There's no neural network. What's, what are we building on there in our consciousness? Well, two parts in my answer to that. The first is, um, one, an amazing thing about our use of tools is that they do extend, tools extend what we can do. So if I become the master of a tool, it does enable me to touch somebody on the other side of the room because I get a new skill. And, and they've, done, they've done sort of um, neural work on, on sort of monkey tool users and find that the monkey's cortical representation of its hand is enhanced when the monkey learns to use a stick to reach farther. So actions on the stick out there activate the brain as would a touching of the hand. Um, so we use tools to extend ourselves. In my view, um, concepts, language, are like tools, and they extend our bodies and they extend our minds. They allow us to solve problems we couldn't solve before and also allow us to frame questions that we couldn't frame before and try to do things. Um, and so your question is exactly picking up on what we were discussing here. What are the limits of how far we can go? 
Um, that's a, it's a very interesting question. I think what we're seeing with new media and new technologies is that we can, in a sort of cyborgian way, enhance ourselves to a really different place than our ancestors might have imagined. Um, and that's very promising and exciting, I think. But we're always, in my view, always limited by what we can do. All that changes is what we can do. <laughs> in other words, we, we acquire the new capacities. So imagination um, is limited. That is, you can't imagine anything. Although with new tools, we can begin to imagine new things. So there's a kind of bootstrapping process by which we open up the space of possibilities for our new forms of life. That's what I would say. Um, well, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you.